Amen, amen. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, guys. Hey, good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Yeah, great, great, great. Uh, with as cold as it is outside and a little bit of rain, it's good to see a nice warm room in here this morning. So you guys are all bringing the body heat this morning, and that's great. Um, I, I'm really excited to be here with you today. I, I am every Sunday. Uh, oftentimes people say, you know, Chris, why don't you take a, a Sunday off? And I think, well, I'd rather take a Tuesday off and have somebody come in and lead staff meeting and let me stay here because Sunday is my is my favorite day of the week. This is my favorite time, and it's largely because of you guys. And this morning, I came in a little bit later, and uh, when I got here to the church at 7.30, it was already full. We've got all kinds of new volunteers that were here this morning, uh, people like everywhere. So as an extreme introvert who has to prepare himself to be extroverted, I walked in and thought, who are all these people? What is, what's, you know, it would take a, a, a time out in the restroom to put my, you know, get ready for it. But I, I just think that was awesome. And, and I, I love seeing the church come to life because you guys are coming to life and you guys are in it. That, I mean, that's really, that's what's so amazing. So if you're one of the people that signed up to be a volunteer, one of the almost 50 people, and today was your first serve, today was the first Sunday that you plugged in, I, I just want to just say thank you so much for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> All right, we're going to get into the message today. I think the band did so good uh, this morning. It was great. So let me, just, let me just speed through this so that they can get back out here and, and you guys can sing some more. But, so over the next three weeks, I'm going to be addressing your, your soul. And, and I know that, okay, for some of us, what exactly is the soul? I think that if you're a, a Christ follower, if you've given your life to Jesus, or you grew up in a church background or a church home, you understand the soul is the thing that Jesus wants. That's the thing that... We give to Jesus. It's like we carry it around in our pocket, some of us front pocket, some of us back pocket, and we say, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to give you my soul, and you pull it out of your pocket, and you say, here you go, Jesus, and now I'm a Christian, and when I die, I will go to heaven, and I won't go to hell. So for a lot of us, that's the extent of what we think about when we think about our soul. But that doesn't actually get us very far in life. It doesn't get us very far throughout our normal day. And here's what we're dealing with, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how do we live with ourselves. So the message series is called Living With Yourself. And we're going to go over three habits to safeguard your soul. I mean, first I'm going to make sure that you understand what your soul is. And I'm going to unpack a little bit what it means to live with yourself. I don't know, you know, a couple of weeks ago I spoke about how I was really into true crime podcasts. And I had a bunch of you out there that lied and said that you also did not listen to those. And Recently, I've gotten into, uh, back in America, we had a show called Cops. Anybody seen Cops? No? Did, did it make its way over here? Oh, man. You got, what's that? Squad cars. Squad cars. Okay. He could have told me anything. I don't know what that means. Okay, so. But there, there's, a, there's, a, there's some YouTube channels that I watch recently where they show like the body cam footage and I like these because the, the purpose of these channels is that is that they're not shining the police in a bad light or even the the person that's committed a crime in a bad light at all the purpose of the channel is actually to bring positivity to both ends of, of law enforcement but um, I heard a, a lady who was getting you know arrested who said, how do, you, how do you live with yourself when you go home at night? Because she felt, you know, violated, like, hey, you know, she felt really upset that she was being arrested because she couldn't stand up and drive a vehicle because she was so intoxicated. So how dare the officer actually arrest her? And she actually asked the question, how do you, how do you live with yourself? You know, another way that we phrase this when we're upset with somebody is, how do you go home and lay your head down on the pillow at the end of the night? You know, how, how, do you, how do you sleep at the end of the night when you know that you're so bad? You know, and, and so this idea of how do you live with yourself, it's like we're, we're asking somebody, or what we're seeing in somebody is we're seeing a version of somebody that we kind of can't believe exists. And we don't understand how they're comfortable with that version of themselves existing alongside the version that they project. Now, I know that that may have just gotten kind of complicated. Another way to put it would be, um, do, do we know anybody that maybe, I mean, you could say like a politician, who on one platform would say, hey, I'm all for these issues and for these people, but then privately maybe they act a little bit differently. 
And so we, we may think as, as voters, as citizens, we may think, how do you do that? How do you live with yourself? How, how can you live with yourself at the end of the day for that? And, and it's, it's, it's for us on our side, especially if you're watching the news, you know, if you're, if you're one of the, the Facebook news cruisers, you know, we'll pray for you. You need to get off of that. You need to get out of that. It's not putting anything positive into your life. But, it, but if, you're, if you're working through that and you think, how, how can they do that? How can they say one thing and then do another thing? And it's hard to understand because on your end, it's easy for you to look at that and say, well, obviously I can see how they're being hypocritical or how they're being two-faced or how their, their, their words don't line up with their actions. But, and the whole point to all this is I need us as a room to recognize a really hard truth is that there's no difference between them and you. See, all of us, we have two things that are at battle with each other. And that, that's, the, that's you and then the you that's on display. So it's easy to point at the TV or to point at social media and say, well, how can they be this way and then act that way? It's easy for us to point at a family member and say, how can they... Uh, at Sunday lunch, just say such lovely things, and then when they leave, just talk so badly about the rest of the family. How can they do that? How can there be two of those things? Well, it's simple, and all of us do this, me included. There's a version of you, and then there's a version of you that you put out on display. Now, for some of you, and actually for all of you, well, to be honest, there's a lot of you that I'm glad that there's a difference between these two. Because I don't need to see the you that's at home, that's comfortable on a Friday night, the kids have gone to bed. I don't need that relaxed version of you uh, out here on display for us in here. So I'm glad that there are some boundaries between how you are at home and how you are here. That, that is, is not a bad thing. But a little bit further than that, we all have a version of us that we keep kind of reserved, that we keep not necessarily hidden, but we hold back. We have a version of us that comes out when we're really comfortable with our friends that we're around. We kind of, you know, drop the shrug, you know, shrug the shoulders, drop kind of the, the facade a little bit. We kind of, you know, get comfortable with the person that we're with. You know, I, I used to love, I used to do a lot of hiring. Now I used to love doing this because we would hire over a course of, you know, four or five months, but we would take people to dinner over and over and over again. And then we would take them and their spouse to dinner. And then we would basically make it seem like they had the job and then take them to like a lunch, kind of as a final thing. And it's that lunch that we saw who we were actually hiring because they dropped, their, they dropped the guard, they felt comfortable, and now they let that version of themselves, who they really were, they let that version out. Now, I, I think that it's okay for there to be some difference between this. But here's where the problem comes in. Is that a lot of us have taken this to an extreme. And so a lot of us are actually suffering from what we know of as multiple personality disorder. Okay, now... I do want to give a very serious disclaimer. If, if you or someone you know does suffer from this medically or clinically, this is not a joke at your expense. So I do want to say up front that, that uh, this is not meant to do that. But I do want to use these words to illustrate to us the links that we will go to in order to preserve or protect or project certain characteristics or qualities about ourselves. And, and what that does is that makes life really, really hard and really, really exhausting. See, there's a version of you that's here at church this morning. You know, you're probably a little bit calm. You're probably not cussing somebody out or throwing rocks at cars. You're probably, you know, a little bit more relaxed. But then there's another version of you that's at home when you walk in the door and the door shuts behind you and that, that version comes out. And then maybe there's another version when you're at work. And then there's a different version of you when you're with your friends. There's one version of you when you're with your spouse at dinner. There's another version of you when you're not with your spouse at dinner. And for our students that are in the room, I mean, I, honestly, I think that you guys have it the absolute hardest. Because you've got to keep up a version of yourself on social media, 
where you can have no flaws. You can have nothing wrong. You're, you're not allowed to have anything wrong with you. You have to be politically correct. You have, to be, uh, you have to know what you can say and what you can't say. The pictures have got to be a certain way. You've got so much to do to keep up with society and culture. And I don't think that's right. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with it. And so you, I think, are at the most danger because you've created a version of yourself that's for the world, that's for social media. And that version of you is oftentimes very, very, very different from who you actually are. And see, what happens when we have these multiple personalities that we're trying to manage is it's really hard to keep track of who you are here and who you are here. And then when you add four or five more of those, it's, it's really hard to keep track of who you are here, 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 and here. See, I'm not smart enough to keep track of any of that. And so that's why there's just really one version of me. And the guys and most people that have been around know this to be pretty true. There is a light filter that is in front of me that filters or that, you know, filters the first level of thoughts that come into my head. But then outside of that, it's all pretty much the same. If I, if I cussed out there outside this church, I would 100% slip and do it in here. And so I just know myself well enough that, you know what, I just need to be me all the time. One, one version of me. But when you're trying to manage so many different versions of yourself, it's really hard to keep them all straight. Because you've got to remember, who, who does this person know me to be? Who does this person know me to be? Who, who, who am I here? Who am I there? And that can be confusing. And what's even worse is when you mess up and you slip and you say something or you do something that doesn't line up with the people that you're around and they all kind of look at you like, yeah, you know, I love when people cuss around me when they know that I'm a pastor and they like, they slip up and they say a cuss word, you know, I just splash water at them, bless you, you know, (laughs) yeah. I just, it's, uh, it's, you know, you see it come over their face like, you know, and I'm like, buddy, come on. I know who, you know, want, just be you, just one you. See, see what I want to do here and what I want to do for us today is I want to make it so that we can just take a step towards being one true version of ourselves, which means for a lot of us, we're going to get to take a huge load off of our shoulders, We're going to get to take a huge, it's like taking a a big notebook of rules of I have to be this way around these different scenarios and just chucking that all out the window. And now there's only just one of you. That's the purpose of this series is, is to put an end to the exhausting work, the exhausting efforts that you go through to cover or hide or manage all the different versions of yourself that you deal with on a day-to-day basis. And so the way that we do that today, I'm going to give you three habits, uh, actually, over the, the course of this series. And these three habits that we're going to talk about, is, is these are habits that are going to ensure that the self that you are living with is the self that's on display. So that, that, that's our goal, that the self that you're living with is the self that's on display. It's the same person. So Josh, put the slide up for us here. So the first habit that we're going to talk about, and we're going to go through them all today, and then we'll circle back around to this surrender your will part. But the the first thing we're going to do is we're going to learn how to surrender our will. And listen, if you're new to church, or if you're not, if you're like, what is this will thing? What's the surrender thing? I told my wife when I was preparing for this that when I read, you know, surrender your will, maybe I have been watching too much cops on TV because I thought surrender what? You want to take what from, you know, I felt almost like defensive. And so, and actually I thought that was great. Like, hey, if you read this here, you hear me say surrender your will and you feel defensive about like, whoa, what do you want? Hey, that's okay. And you're perfectly fine to feel that way. In fact, it's my job to help you realize that, no, this is a good thing. It's a safe thing and it's an easy thing. So we'll get there together. But the, the second thing we're going to talk about, and this is next week, is how to monitor your heart. And that's going to be such a great one. And then the third habit is is how to open your hands. There we go. How to open up your hands. So these three habits over the next three weeks are going to lead us to a place where we're going to be able to say that the person that I am is the person that I am all across the board. 
Now, because I don't like to take a lot of liberty in things, I don't feel like I'm entitled for you to believe me just because I stand up here and, and I say the things that I say. I haven't earned that from many of you. And so I, I thought, okay, well, why would you actually need these habits? How, how can I sell this to you? And, and I, I started to really think about that. And I thought, okay, well, what does that do for me? What's good for me? And I, so I've got three reasons here. Why might you need these habits? So this is for you. If you felt a little bit defensive about, oh, I've got to surrender my will. What does he want to take from me? What does God want to take from me? Pay, pay attention to these three here. Here's why that's nice for you. Number one, I want you to be happy and in love. Meaning, I want you to walk around with light shoulders, light feet, and be happy. And I want you to be happy with who you are, and I want you to be in love with who you are. I want you to love yourself. That's the purpose of this, is that you actually love who you are. You're happy about who you are. And that would solve a world of issues if we could all just be happy about who we are. The second one that would be good for you is this. I want you to be secure and free. I want you to be secure in your identity. And because you're so secure in your identity, you're actually free. You feel free to be whoever you decide that you want to be. I mean, imagine if you were happy and in love with yourself, if you were secure in your identity and felt free to walk in that identity. Am I, hopefully I'm painting a picture that looks and sounds attractive to you. You know, the, the third thing that you can get from this, and, and this is the one we're really going to focus on, is, is I want you to be free from the trap. And so let's, let's talk about this, this trap. I had fun with, with this one, and, and this is something we all fall into. The trap, the trap that we're talking about today, it's just like a regular trap, just like you would use for, for animals. It, it's the, the same kind of concept. See, a trap is something that, that you don't know that you're going to get caught up into. It's something that kind of lures you into it. It's something that you get stuck and you get, you get caught in and you can't get out of. You know, we, we, don't, we trap animals so that they get stuck, so that they get caught. You know, we, we trap things for a specific reason, and it's usually not for a great reason. We trap mice in this building, just so you know, we've got 40 or 50 mice that could be crawling under your chairs. No, I'm kidding. Some people that raise their feet. Check your handbags on the way out. <laughs> Consider it a parting prize if you walk away with, uh, with the mouse. If you get a pair, then... No, okay, so anyway. So, back to the traps. So, I want you to look at this here. Traps, traps are set... And Josh is going to put this on the screen for us. Traps are not set to help you. They're meant to hide from you. They're meant to stop you. They're meant to hold you. And they're meant to prepare you. Just like traps are used for an animal. It's meant to grab you and stop you. Traps are hidden. There's not a sign that says, this is a trap. Beware. Be careful. There's a secret trap coming up in front of you. No, it's the exact opposite. It's meant to blend in like you never know it's going to be there. And all of a sudden, you fall into it and you get caught up in the trap. And when you do, it's designed to hold you there and to keep you there. And what it's holding you and keeping you for is not a good thing. Whether you're a little mouse or whether you're you know, something else, it's not a good thing. So my hope for you today is this. My hope is that we can open the trap. Now, I hope that at the end of this message, we, we at least can get to a place where we can pry the trap open and pull your leg out of it. Now, if you do that, and I'm talking about the trap of living a double life, living multiple lives, that trap of I've got to keep up with this, I've got to keep up the facade, if you can let go of that and pry out of that and pull your leg or your arm or whatever is stuck, your heart, or your head, whatever is stuck in that trap, if you can pull it out, then I have to be honest with you. I've got to let you know that you're still going to be left with a wound. You're still going to have to deal with what happened when you got stuck and caught in that trap. See, the fact about traps is this, is that traps don't release you completely unscathed. If you've ever seen, um, you know, I grew up in, in East Tennessee, lots of hunting and we would trap uh, like raccoons and, and things like that, especially to get them kind of off of a property. And, and then the ASPCA would come and they would take them and relocate them somewhere else. But there was like humane trapping with these cages. 
So when they came in, they stepped on a plate, and it would, the thing would fall behind them, and they'd get stuck there. And, and you walk away with them, take them to somebody else's back garden, and, you know, pull the door up, and, you know, and there they, there they go, you know, completely unharmed, you know. Throw some food over the wall for them. But then there's other traps that, like, we've maybe seen in the movies, or some of us that have gone hunting, or you've watched cartoons where it's the jaws that, that open up there, and if you step on the middle plate, it, it snaps in on you. That's the trap that, that living a double life gets you in. And when you pry that open and pull your leg out, that there's going to be some pain there. There's going to be a wound there. So here's what you can expect. If you make a decision today, I want to step out of the trap. I want to pull my leg out of this trap. What you can expect to see today is a wound that's left where that trap closed down on you. And that wound may be... Um, the wound that you're going to see may be between you and your family. It may be a relationship that needs to be healed. It may be a relationship with yourself. It may be something uh, within your, your coworkers, your colleagues, or spouse, or significant other. But I, w- I want you to think about when you have to come clean and tell a group of people, hey, this version of me is actually not me. It, it's actually this here. Or if you have to go to a spouse or significant other and confess, hey, I've been living differently outside of you over here. And I need, to, I need to get out of that trap. So I need to come to you. I need to confess this piece to you here. That's a wound. And that's going to leave a wound. So I don't want to paint this picture that, that if, if you accept Jesus and you give him your soul and he opens the trap, that you just walk away skipping down the hallway. Because that, that's not the way it is. You're, you're going to be wounded. You're going to have to deal with some of those wounds. That's where community and where we can come alongside you. And we can help you with that. But you've got to know that it is going to hurt. But what I can promise you, and none of us like to step into anything that's going to hurt. That's why it's called a trap. Because you didn't know it was going to get you. But it did. But I can promise you this. is That piece by piece and bit by bit, every single day, you'll find more and more and more things about yourself that you love. You'll find more reasons to love yourself. You'll find more things about yourself that are healed. And it'll be bit by bit by bit, piece by piece by piece. And then before you know it, I promise you, there can be a healed heart, a healed relationship. There can be whatever was broken can be healed and can be restored. So the question that I have for you is this. It, is this me? I want you to ask yourself this question. Is anything that you've heard in the last 22 minutes have anything to do with your life? And I spent so much time unpacking this on the front end because I believe that a lot of us are this. But I also know that it's really hard because a lot, if, if, if this is you and you're like me, There's a defensive version of me that when I get confronted with something I don't want to deal with, I just have that person step up and just, you know, shadow and boom. Now I don't have to deal with it. And so I I wanted to make sure that if you threw up your defensive wall and said, don't talk to me about confessing or coming clean or, or closing different worlds down or being the same across every different world, I'm just going to throw up the defenses there. If I wanted to really try and talk you out of that. So if if any of this is you, then I would invite you to learn this next habit that we're going to talk about today. And and that's the first one we go back to this. And it's surrender your will. And I'm going to give you a quick how-to guide on how to do this. And we find this in Romans here. And Romans is is a book that was written by Paul. This is a letter that he wrote to to the church in Romans. So this is to the... The, the growing body of Christ um, in Rome at the time. And Paul is writing them this letter. And he's giving them instructions. And, and he, he writes this verse in Romans 12, 1. And it's got a couple different things in it that I hope can disarm you so that you don't feel threatened about the idea of having to uh, surrender something to God. In fact, I hope it does the opposite. I hope it opens up your heart and your eyes to see that actually that's not that bad of a thing. That's not that big of a deal. So let's let's look at how Paul puts it. Now understand, in order for this to work in your life, you have to believe that this matters and that this is true. And I can't make you believe that. 
And, and I can't make you accept and believe that, that you've got to confront the different personalities and lives that you're living. But I hope that something out of this sounds so good and so promising to you that you decide, you know what, I'm going to try that. I'm going to let a little bit of it leak into my life. And so let's, let's let it leak together. So I'm going to read. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. So Paul is talking to his church. He's talking to the, the Christ followers, the Christians, the people that were following Jesus' way at the time. Just like we're talking together here. Paul says, hey guys, because that's the way I would have written it. Hey buddy, hey what's up? In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, It doesn't seem like a super significant verse up to this point. But this word mercy... So Paul says, in light of God's mercy, offer yourself as a sacrifice. So give something up to God in light of God's mercy. It doesn't say because God is the punisher. It doesn't say because Jesus has superpowers. It doesn't say because you're so bad and if you don't do it, I'm going to send you to hell. No, it says, Paul says, because God is a merciful God, because God is so good, this is why I want you to give up yourselves as a living sacrifice. Look at the definition for the word mercy. That Paul could have used any word, but he chose mercy because that's what God wants us to know in this. And it's, mercy is the compassionate treatment of those in distress, especially when it is within one's power to punish or harm them. Yeah, an even better definition of mercy is when you contrast it with grace. So, so look at this one here. Grace is a gift we don't deserve. While mercy is not getting the punishment that we do deserve. See, that's what God is for us. So that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, hey, in light of the fact that God has mercy for you. So, hey, hey, Chris, God is not going to give you the punishment that you deserve. So because of that loving God, can you offer yourself up to be a living sacrifice for him? So the first thing that I want you to catch from this before we go to the living sacrifice part is that God is a merciful God. He's not out to get you. He's not out to destroy you. This is not in light of God the anger. This is in light of God the merciful who does not give us the punishment that we deserve. So then he goes on. Now that we've got that out of the way, he says this. You're going to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Now, the word that he's using here in bodies, it means everything. If you look in the Amplified, which is my favorite translation, it says you're, you're inside, you're outside, uh, the sock that's twisted around your right foot right now, everything. You're going to give all of it to God. You're just going to offer all of it up to him. That's what that word bodies means. It's everything. And then the idea of a living sacrifice. See, Paul's talking to people at a time where they had to go and they had to give sacrifices for forgiveness. Well, Jesus came, and Jesus died on the cross, and they no longer need that. So now what Paul is basically saying is that God is like, Hey, I'm so good to you. I've got mercy for you. Give yourself, give all of yourself to me as a living sacrifice. I Meaning you don't have to die, but you're giving yourself as a sacrifice to me. You're sacrificing one, two, three versions of yourself to become just one. The one that I've chosen, the one I died for, the one I sent my son for. And in fact, I kind of wrote out a statement that I feel like God is saying to you. So this is from God to you. I want you to choose to give me everything because you see that I gave you love even though you did not deserve it. This is what it is to surrender your will. It's just you choosing to give God everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Because you know that God has withheld what you actually deserve. And instead, he's covered you in grace, covered you in his love, covered you in absolute blessing. And if you don't believe that about yourself right now, if you're here in this room and you say, how can God be gracious? How can God be loving? I don't believe it. I don't see it. Let me, let me just tell you that you're here right now. And because you're here right now, we have people that tithe every single month that give of their income so that we can be in here. This building is paid for every month because people in here believe in the mission and vision of what Jesus is doing for this church. You're here right now, and so are about 50, maybe 60 volunteers across this whole campus. Do you know why those, are all, those people are all here? 
They're here because of what God has called us to do. You're here right now and you don't believe in Jesus. You don't believe in the goodness of God. I want you to look around. The carpet tiles that you're sitting on came from volunteers that laid these by hand. The chairs that you're sitting in came from volunteers that brought these. The walls that you're looking at came from volunteers that painted these walls black because they believed in the vision and the mercy and the grace and the goodness of Jesus. So if you don't believe that God loves you, that Jesus loves you, maybe because of circumstances in your life, I'm here to tell you that in this room there is no better picture of God loving you and that God calling to you, I want to love you. The whole reason that I'm here is so that you know, the whole reason our volunteers are here, the whole reason we have this service is so that the one person that comes in here that doesn't believe that Jesus loves them can get a glimpse of what it's like to be loved by Jesus. And that just may be you today. And if you don't, if you don't want to do this, let's look at what your alternative is. Your alternative is to just stay in the trap. And unfortunately, this is something that we would all convince ourselves is actually the better option. Because we would all say that it's a lot easier just to stay in the trap and not deal with the wound. It's easier than opening the trap up and dealing with it and seeing how much damage is done and how much damage is there. That's, that's just so much easier. I'd much rather just not deal with it. I'll just stay in the trap. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that you could make. And the reason that it's a mistake is that you're not aware of the freedom that Christ has given you. So you only stay in a trap because you don't believe in yourself and your capacity and your ability to walk when you get out of it. You believe that when you get out of that trap, you're going to be a broken person. Everyone's going to know that you're broken. Nothing can be healed. Nothing can be restored. You'd rather just stay in the trap. Because then at least you have an excuse. I can't do anything. I'm stuck in the trap. I'm stuck here. I'm sorry. And that's, that's a lie for you. And here, here's why that's a lie. If we look in Romans 6... Verse 14. So it says, Sin is no longer your master. Do you know what causes people to create a different facade, especially for maybe like a social media platform? It's, it's, I, I'm just going to say it's sin. So may, may, maybe it would be lust drives likes. So the, the, the less you wear, the more likes you get. The more likes you get, the more validated you are. Maybe you're in a friend group at school where if you don't have, if you're not averaging, you know, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 likes a day on a post, they look at you like, who are you? You know, and that, that's, somebody, that's the reality for somebody's world. And so you have sin has driven you to create a separate version of yourself. And you've created that version to keep this secret part in your heart safe. Because there's a part of you that doesn't like it. There's a part of you that wants to be pure, that wants to love purely, that wants to be loved purely. But because of the sin in the world, you've taken that pure part in you, and you've put it in a little box, and you've built a little wall around it. And you've hidden it away in your heart so that hopefully nothing can get to it. Hopefully nothing can touch it. And you pull your camera phone out, you pull your iPhone or your whatever out, and you take the picture, you put on the smile, you take off some of the clothes. And the whole time, that special little innocent part of you, you've just tucked away. And at first, you just pray, I, I hope that that doesn't come out. I hope that, that, doesn't, that, that what's coming out doesn't touch, it doesn't leak into the pure part of me. But over time... As sin in the world, whether it be lust or whether it be a, a desire for a fulfillment through something other than God, like alcohol or drugs or relationships or wh whatever it is, that, that begins to leak or it begins to hide that innocent, pure thing that you were created with, that God put in you. So sin takes that away from us. And the reason that we feel like we can't come out of that box we can't pull the innocent, the pure part of ourselves back out. It's because it, it's been hidden for so long, we actually don't even know where it is anymore. See, that, that's the, the you that's you is not the you that's on display. The you that has been on display is on display 
because we live in a sinful world. But what Paul is telling you, 14-year-old, 13-year-old girl who, who is struggling with your body image, who's struggling with covering yourself up because you want attention and you want somebody to love you and somebody to reach for you, because you want to matter in somebody's life and every like is something that matters. It, it means that somebody thought enough about you to double tap a picture that for, for you that is hurting so bad that you've just dug a deep hole and pushed it down in there, I want you to know that sin does not have to be your master. Which means that if sin is not your master, you no longer have to live under the requirements of the law, meaning you don't have to get punished by God or by anybody else for letting sin be your master for, for a period of time. You're no longer covered under that and you're not held by that law anymore because of what Jesus did. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. That means that that little bit of you, all of you, for whatever reason it is, that little bit that God made when he made you. I think about my son Wyatt running up and down the hallways. He's this tall. He's just running around all happy. Right now, that, that, little, that little innocent bit in him is, is all of him, head to toe. And as life happens, life's going to knock him and knock him and knock him. And that little bit of him is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. If he follows the same trajectory that we do, and before you know it, that little bit that God made that's so wonderful, that's so pure and that's so innocent, is so small and tiny and tucked away. And that is something that we don't have to let that be that way anymore because of God's grace. Sin is no longer your master. So here's, how you, here's what we can do. And this is our, our last point here. Is how, do, how do we surrender our will daily? So this idea of, of I'm going to surrender my soul. I'm going to surrender my will to God. The idea of doing that is, is what I'm talking about here. How do you take that little piece of you that little innocent piece of you that you've tucked away and let life chip away at, that you've tucked away for safekeeping, how do we take all the other bits of you, all the other versions of you, and just push them aside and throw them away and let that little piece come out? Well, it's going to take time. And it happens daily. It happens through a daily practice. So how do I do this daily? I've got a prayer for you that I want to read over you this morning and Josh, you can put that on the screen here. So this happens every day, and there's no magic in this, as Jesus is in this. And so this happens because you wake up every day, and you just surrender to Jesus every day. You know what's so great about surrendering? Is you don't actually have to do anything after you surrender. It's like it requires the least from you than anything else could require from you. That's what's so glorious about it, is it's just surrender. You just surrender. So we think surrender costs us something. It does cost you some things. You're going to have to come clean in a relationship. You're going to have to let, let all those other sin-filled versions of yourself die and be put to death so that that little one in you can come out and grow. I mean, I, I think that the illustration of, of Wyatt running around, if you don't know my son, then I'm, I'm sorry. Hopefully you see him one day running up and down the hallways, but... How do we go from pure joy at this to broken, destroyed, suicidal, alcoholic, devastated, protective, don't want to open up to anybody, don't want to let anybody into my heart, don't want to believe that God loves me, that God's for me. I don't want to believe that, that, that I'm worthy of anything unless... I fit a certain mold or a certain view. How do, we, how do we go from here to here? How does that happen to every single one of us? It does. It's happened to every single one of us. The purpose of this week is that we take that back. Is that we, we claim it. And then we can look at our whole selves. Surrender to God. Which means our whole selves is one self. And it's that self that God made and he put so much joy in. And he put so much wonder and amazement in. 
So I'm going to give you an easy way to do this. You start your morning every morning with this. I, I did this this morning. You guys, you can take a picture of it, or you can catch this online. The service will be up on YouTube. You can grab it off of there. But there's nothing fancy in here. This is not an incantation or some kind of secret magic thing where you have to say the words in a certain order for it to work. No, this is just you sitting alone. I sat this morning at, at 5.30. I sat at my desk. I had a cup of coffee. And I sat there with a pen and a piece of paper. And I, I had this up on a screen in front of me. And I just wrote it out. I just wrote it like three times. Because sometimes it takes a while for things to sink in and absorb in, into me. And so here's, here's the prayer. I, just, I want you to close your eyes. And I'm just going to read this over you. And as I read this prayer over you, I want you to imagine in you. So, so I, eyes closed. Let's play a game here. Everyone with your eyes closed. I want you to imagine in you a tiny, tiny, tiny bright light that, that God has just taken this bright light, it's come down out of, the, out of the sky, and he's just taken it and he's placed it and he's just tapped you right on the heart and he's put that little bright light in your heart. And that is a little tiny seed. No matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, no matter how worthy you are or how unworthy you are, no matter how sinful you are, no matter how bad the worst thing that you've done is, everyone in this room right now has the same little seed that God has put in your heart. And the purpose of this seed is when I read this prayer over you, we're just watering it. We're watering it and we're adding fertilizer to it. And every day... What you're going to do is you're going to wake up in the morning, close your eyes. You're going to imagine a tiny, little, bright, white light of a seed. And when you speak God's truth over that seed, it's going to grow. And we all grow together. So with your eyes closed, I'm going to say, over the seed that God's put in all of you, Heavenly Father, I surrender myself to you. My hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, my thoughts and desires, my hopes and my dreams, my talent and my opportunities, I surrender all. Thy will be done through me today. I surrender all. You guys can open your eyes. I'm going to have the band that's going to come out and it's going to lead us in a song. And we've got prayer partners that, that are going to come down to the front corners of the room. And the purpose in, in them being here is, is for you. If you need prayer for anything at all, don't be ashamed. Life's too short for that. Just come down. Uh, if you just even walk to the corner, someone will walk up to you and they'll help you with that. They'll pray for you about anything in the world. No pressure, no nothing. But for the rest of us, life is about to happen out there. Life's going to get crazy. It's going to get wild. Before you go out there, let me give you three more minutes in here where you can just stand and sing and, and let God speak to you about that pure and wonderful and beautiful seed that He's planted in you, which is His intention for you. So let's bow our heads and pray as the band comes out. Heavenly Father.